Good afternoon and welcome to the launch of the Atlantic Council's Commission on Defence Innovation Adoption Interim Report. My name is Clementine Starling and I'm the director of the Atlantic Council's Forward Defence Programme. Today's discussion marks the initial release of the major policy recommendations of our Commission. Our full report will be released later this year. Today, you will hear from our distinguished co-chairs, former U.S. Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, and former Secretary of the U.S. Air Force, Deborah Lee James, who have led this effort since its inception. We will also discuss the interim report's recommendations with its authors, Whitney McNamara and Pete Mendigliani. This will be followed by a panel conversation moderated by our Commission Project Director, Stephen Rodriguez, with our co-chairs and some heavyweights from our Commission, former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Michelle Florinoy, and former Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, Ellen Lord. So we've got a lot of really great stuff in store for you today. Here at the Atlantic Council, our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security works to develop sustainable, nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and its allies and partners. The Centers for Defense program generates ideas and connects stakeholders in the defense ecosystem to identify the defense strategies, capabilities, and resources the US needs to deter and, if necessary, prevail in future conflict. So why are we here? Over the past seven months, we have gathered a distinguished commission of former officials, experts, and private sector representatives who share a common vision that while the United States leads the world in many technologies critical to national security, its present acquisition system is overly burdened by regulation, too risk averse, and not set up to adopt cutting edge technology from the leading edge of the private sector. Our goal was to put forward recommendations to help the Department of Defense's ability to accelerate adoption of promising innovations in order to deliver high impact operational solutions to US warfighters. After multiple commission meetings and dozens and dozens of interviews across the federal government and Congress, our co-authors, Pete Medigliani, Whitney McNamara, and Eric, Lof Eric Lofgren have drafted 10 recommendations to address the enterprise challenges which impede the rapid adoption and scaling of critical technologies and capabilities. We recognize that this is far from the first effort to address defense innovation or acquisition reform. Indeed, this interim report builds upon previous efforts such as the Section 809 panel. But our report is laser focused on immediately actionable recommendations that respond to the urgent need for change in the face of today's increasingly acute global threats, which range from Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine to the very pacing threat set by China. You'll hear more about that and much more uh, from our panelists. I would like to give a very special thank you to all of the sponsors of the commission, Accrete AI, ACT1, Applied Intuition, Palantir, Paraton, Primer AI, Rebellion Defense, Schmidt Futures, and Snowpoint Ventures. And a special thank you to Booz Allen Hamilton, our foundational partner. We are so grateful to be joined by Stephen Escaravage, one of our industry commissioners, and Booz Allen's executive vice president and artificial intelligence lead. I'll pass over to Stephen in a minute. He will share some remarks. Just in terms of housekeeping, uh, this event is public and on the record. We encourage our in-person and virtual audience to please submit your questions during the Q&A sessions. We um, will have an iPad being passed around the room for those who want to submit it in person and then on Zoom via the Q&A function. And you can join the discussion on Twitter and LinkedIn using the hashtag Forward Defense. Thank you all so much for being here. Without further ado, Stephen, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Clementine. Thank you, everybody who has attended in person or online today. It's exciting to see the release of the interim report, which builds on the idea that the American private industry can offer even greater strategic competitive advantage to the Department of Defense if we implement a series of actions that are outlined in the report. And as one of the industry commissioners over the last year, I've seen firsthand exactly how 
we can unlock that potential. And it's through the sharing of experiences. Examples where we've seen rapid adoption of emerging commercial technologies and examples of challenges where uh, accumulated technical debt or administrative hurdles, nuances and acquisition requirements, limited progress. So for me, from an industry perspective, two major takeaways to date. One is we have to continue to come together collectively, share those observations, share those experiences with the department, opportunities for positive change, so we can elevate that and mitigate it through actions. And then second, we, industry, need to proactively adopt the recommendations that we're making to the department. And let me give you some examples. For established defense companies, we need to accelerate the true collaboration and partnering with non-traditional dual-use tech startups. And we've got to pivot to a buy-first mentality versus a build-first mentality. There's much more work to do between now and September in collecting those examples, providing the blueprints for how we could build together to a more uh, innovative Department of Defense. I'm convinced the excellent team at the Atlantic Council will guide us there. And uh, it goes without saying that the execution and planning of the entire commission has been flawless. So thank you very much. With that, I have the, the, the privilege of introducing our two esteemed co-chairs for the commission. Former Secretary of Defense, Dr. Mark Esper, and former Secretary of the Air Force, Deborah Lee James. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's great to see such a filled room. So much interest in what is a, a really important topic. So I thank you all for joining us here today. I first want to thank Fred Kemp and the Atlantic Council team for all they've done to bring us to this moment over the past year. I especially want to thank Stephen Rodriguez, Clem Starling, who's already been introduced, Mark Massa, and our great author experts, uh, Whitney McNamara and Pete uh, Modigliani, for their hard work, diligence, patience, and inclusiveness. Lastly, I want to thank my very capable co-chair, uh, Secretary Deborah James, for her leadership and insights, and for all the other commissioners and experts who contributed to this study over the past year. It has been a great team effort. Last month, Secretary James and I wrote an op-ed on this topic that began with this assertion. The era of great power competition is fully underway and has transitioned to a more dangerous level. Russia's unwarranted invasion of Ukraine and China's increasing tensions with Washington, coupled with Moscow's and Beijing's increasing closeness, evident with almost every week that passes, are proof positive that the world's leading autocracies aim to change the global rules to suit their own malevolent aims. In short, the freedoms many of the world's democracies have enjoyed for decades are under increasing threat. The Biden administration has called the next 10 years the decisive decade, and a bipartisan Congress appropriated the largest defense budget ever last year to meet this challenge. The Defense Department, through at least two different administrations now, also recognizes these tough times. It has undertaken multiple initiatives over the last several years to retain the military's overmatch over Russia and especially China in areas ranging from personnel and logistics to training and doctrine. One of the most critical tasks on this agenda is modernizing the force with new weapon systems and equipment to ensure a clear advantage against our potential adversaries. Quickly adopting cutting edge technology, which is mostly found in the commercial sector, is the key to guaranteeing U.S. military dominance critical to deterring war and winning one if all else fails. The United States is the global leader when it comes to innovation. We are the envy of the world. We do not have an innovation problem in this country. However, the Pentagon's ability to quickly adopt this advanced technology is woefully inadequate. That is where the problem resides. Organizational initiatives over the years, such as the Defense Innovation Unit, the Air Force Rapid Capabilities Office, 
and Army Futures Command, which I established in 2018, have helped address this problem. But more must be done given the storm clouds ahead. That is why we, as former senior Pentagon leaders, Capitol Hill veterans, and defense industry executives agreed to co-chair the Atlantic Council's Commission on Defense Innovation Adoption. The Commission's mission, which we worked hard not to stray from, is focused on providing DOD and Congress with actionable solutions to accelerate the Department's adoption of commercial technology. Many startups and small high-tech firms are developing novel solutions to the warfighting problems the Pentagon has identified. However, they face, face steep regulatory hurdles, inadequate communication and uncertainty about the demand for their product that raises questions about their viability. If fortunate enough to survive this gauntlet, they then face the infamous valley of death, that 18 to 24 month period of no funding that it often takes DOD to award a contract. It is hard to keep employees and investor support for that long, especially if the Pentagon is only committing to buying a few prototypes. I've seen this up close. A major obstacle to better outcomes is DOD's complicated, heavily regulated, risk-averse acquisition processes. The current system requires multiple sign-offs and layers of review that make it easy for participants to slow a program down or even avoid using new authorities given them by Congress to speed things up because incentives to be bold and to move fast are not sufficient. Another challenge imposed on the Pentagon by Congress are the budget rules and restrictions that severely limit DOD's ability to quickly adapt to changes in the threat, the supply chain, technology, or tactics. The inflexibility of the department's budget at meaningful dollar amounts leaves the United States unable to deliver key capabilities to match the increasing speed of ingenuity by our adversaries. Fortunately, there are sensible solutions our commission has developed to begin addressing these impediments and more. Some will require collaboration between the Pentagon and Congress. Others require DOD take better advantage of existing authorities. And a few call on department leadership to alter the status quo. These range from simplifying the Pentagon's acquisition progress through the empowerment of uh, program executive officers by moving away from individual programs to broader portfolio capability management, to increasing spending flexibility for acquisition officials by consolidating program elements and budget lines so DOD can more easily insert novel technologies into the force without starting a new program. These are just a couple of the recommendations we offer to accelerate innovation adoption at the Pentagon. We'll be running through them all in a few uh, minutes in quite detail. Needless to say, some ideas will be more di difficult than others to implement, while some will require more funding to be sex successful, and still others will take a long time to execute. All, however, will require cooperation, compromise, trust, open-mindedness, and active visionary leadership from key officials at the Pentagon and on Capitol Hill if we are to deliver for our warfighters and the American people. It is how we will win the future. With that, I'd like to turn the podium over to my co-chair, Secretary Debbie James. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and I just want to echo his comments of gratitude to the Atlantic Council staff, to our uh, esteemed authors who put so much time and effort, and very importantly, to our commissioners, who collectively we represent probably upwards of 100 years of experience in both the government and um, private industry sectors. And that's not even that we're that old, but we've, we've got several commissioners, and so we've got a lot of experience between all of us. I'd just like to foot stomp several points that have already been made in an effort to tee up the discussion that we're about to engage in with the specifics. The United States of America does not, does not have an innovation problem, but we do have within the Department of Defense an innovation adoption problem. Under Secretary of Research and Engineering a few years back, Heidi Hsu uh, came out with 14 critical technologies the summary of which, the combination of which, she said would represent the future of successful warfare, the future of American and allied warfare. 
11 of those 14 critical technologies are not driven by government spending. They are not driven by development within the Department of Defense. Rather, they are driven by and paid for primarily by the private sector. Yet DOD, even knowing this, struggles all too often to identify, to adopt, to integrate, and field these technologies. Now here come the two key points, quickly and at scale. Quickly and at scale. Uh, now there's a number of reasons for this. You've heard them already. DOD's acquisition and requirements processes, which let's face it, they were built in a different era. They deliver systems to meet requirements that may have been defined over a decade earlier, and yet the whole world has changed in the intervening time. Now, to be sure, there are pockets of innovation, pockets of excellence and speed within the department where things move more quickly, but these are pockets, and what we would like to see is we would like to see this become the norm, not just pockets here and there. So we need to keep pressing. DIU, for example, is one such uh, pocket and um, one of our recommendations must have been another Washington leak. Secretary Austin just announced it already. Uh, he stole a bit of our fire, but we are very glad to see that DIU will be once again a direct report to the secretary and the deputy secretary because that will provide focus to this sort of innovative, innovative process that we're calling for. Number two, cumbersome reporting requirements and traditions between the department and Congress do not allow for very much uh, needed flexibility and speed of execution. We absolutely can do better on this if the will is there to do better and this needs to change. Number three, though progress has been made in recent years, DOD is still too difficult to do business with. And this is especially true for the young companies, small commercial firms that do not have experience with the department, but nonetheless have some of this innovative technology that we would very much like to get access to in the department. So we need to keep bringing down the barriers for those companies to be able to enter the DOD space. So, uh, shame on us if we didn't try to move rapidly. We did. We did not want to move, miss this congressional cycle, and so we have tried to come out very rapidly with 10 key findings, 10 key uh, recommendations, all of which you heard we believe to be actionable, all of which are doable if people, Congress, DOD, are simply willing to make some changes, and we believe the sum total of these will advance the ball when it comes to DOD's innovation adoption problems. And by the way, based on the current world conditions, the geopolitical concerns that we are facing, we feel that time is of the essence. We've got to get going with this. Indeed, time may be running out. So thank you very much for your participation today. We're glad you're here, and let me turn it back over to you, Clem. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, it was really such an honor to hear from Secretary Esper and Secretary James, um, and they really have been the, the visionary leaders of this effort. Um, but I am so thrilled to be sat down with two of our incredible authors. Uh, Whitney McNamara is a Vice President of Beacon Global Strategies and supported DOD uh, S&T um, work for several years. And Pete Medigliani, who is the defense acquisition lead at the MITRE Corporation. And not to give your age away, Pete, but Pete has 26 years <laughs> worth of defense acquisition experience. And then not joining us today um, is Eric Lofgren, who is our third author. And Eric, after finishing uh, the report with us, went to join um, the Senate Armed Services Committee. I'd love to say we can take credit for him joining there, but, but no, he, he got there. Um, so we'll be talking about some of the recommendations that, that he um, really, really fed into, but a huge credit to Eric. Um, so let's get stuck in. This discussion is about getting into the nitty gritty of what we actually have in this report, both in terms of the enterprise challenges that, that were uh, discussed a little bit by our co-chairs, and then the 10 recommendations. So I have some questions um, to get at that, but I would really, really encourage questions from our virtual and in-person audience members. I'd love to tee up your questions for the authors. Um, but I'll start with saying that this commission was really made up of some heavy hitters <laughs> from major industries, from government, defense, tech startups, and capital markets. And, and we, as part of the commission, conducted 
I want to say around 65 interviews, it could have been a little bit more than that, um, with lots of officials um, and experts and, and folks in industry. So Pete Whitney, from those discussions, what were some of the foundational or common challenges and pain points that were highlighted across all of those engagements? I think for me, one of the biggest ones was just a general lack of understanding around leading edge technology and more specifically the applications around leading edge technologies. And I think subconsciously that allows the department to sort of uh, push dealing with it to the right. But what then what happens is when these technologies start to mature, um, there becomes almost an hysteria about it, right? Like marked by confusion and hype about what this technology is and isn't. And I think that sometimes really obscures meaningful conversations about what it would look like to leverage, adopt, or even defend against these technologies. If we use AI as an example, um, I think just the lack of understanding around what AI could tangibly do for different parts of an organization, whether you're sitting at Fort Benning, the Comptroller's office, the E-ring of the Pentagon, um, I really think that's continually cited as one of the reasons why AI has sort of failed to adopt, at least at scale, uh, across the department, despite a lot of hand-wringing uh, conversations and initiatives around it. Uh, the other two main ones, I think, are ones that our audience are going to be really familiar with. Uh, one is just the outdated R&D model that our co-chairs just uh, referenced as well. Just the idea that DOD's uh, requirements and acquisition processes are designed for a time when the department was the global R&D leader. I think as of 2020, our uh, sort of um, national R&D uh, made up about 20% of, of current spending. Um, and, you know, we still have the DARPA, FFRDCs, uh, national and service laboratories, universities uh, that continue to innovate with really great success. But unfortunately, they're very infrequently tied um, to commercialization and adoption pipelines. So ultimately, the fact is that I think we'll be um, foot stomping many times here today is that some of the most critical technologies that we need come from the commercial sector, and yet we really struggle to adopt them on relevant timelines. And lastly, the valley of death of course, as you know, everyone in the audience is already familiar with as well. Basically, the long timelines for contracts, funding, program constraints, disconnected ecosystems are just some of the transition challenges that vendors would face in trying to bring their offerings to bear to the department. The department spends billions annually on research and prototypes, but again, yet only a small percentage uh, transition to actual production contracts with sufficient revenue to sustain a company uh, and scale its offerings. So those are the main three for me. Yeah, so for me, it, it starts with the long timelines to deliver you know, capabilities. When we're talking 10 plus years to go from idea to IOC, that's just you know, painfully long. When we're talking about DOD's major systems aren't gonna be delivered until the 2030s, when the threat window is a much shorter timeline. So getting through requirements, budget, and acquisition in a shorter timeline has to be done. Uh, the other big one is being how program-centric we are. Mm -hmm. So it starts with we write a requirement for a system to often replace the 30-year-old legacy system. Uh, we then you know, spend years you know, securing a budget, then go through long acquisition timelines to design, develop, and test for the program, and we box it all in with a program baseline. So as things change along the way, you know, we're already you know, overly constraining this program environment into a program environment. And the third big one is just the hamstrung workforce. Uh, I've seen this at all echelons of, of the bureaucracy of, you know, we talk about the risk-averse culture, but you gotta unpack why. So heavily regulated, you know, focused on compliance with the endless array of policies and statute, heavy amounts of oversight. So when you have those innovators lean forward and say, I'm going to try something new or I'm going to grab some you know, novel technology and apply it in a new way, the antibodies come out and just attack. So I've seen many innovators leave just you know, out of frustration, and we really need to rethink the culture to say, you know, how can we harness you know, leading technology and get it out to theater quickly? Thank you both. So I think so that's a very good recap, I think, of the, the enterprise challenges that, that we identified. I want to dig into a little bit then, okay, so <laughs> none of that sounds good. What do, what do we do about it? Um, and we, re we structured this report from an analytical perspective and um, a little bit in the writing of it in, in three parts. Um, so overlapping challenges. One, tech adoption challenges. Two, acquisition hurdles. And then three, budgeting problems. So Pete, 
one of the headline recommendations, and, and you just touched on it there t towards the end, is shifting to a capability, uh, capability portfolio acquisition model in instead of the, the current model. Can you describe what that means um, and why it would be such a game changer for the department? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the capability portfolio management, really at the tactical level, can unlock so many opportunities. And when we talk in you know, a portfolio management, it's really at the tactical level. So DOD has roughly 60 program executive officers, PEOs, and they oversee the execution of anywhere from 50 to 200 or so programs managing through the life cycle. We say, hey, pick five of them, and they're going to operate through a new capability model. So it starts with requirements. So let's stop you know, just defining 200 you know, JSTS documents for requirements and start with a capstone requirements document to say, what's your North Star? What are the operational performance measures you want us to move the needle on? And then we'll focus, on, focus our acquisition systems on that, as well as research, both within the department and focus industry <laughs> on, hey, these are our needs. From a budget perspective, you know, people here portfolio management think we're going to group it all into one big portfolio. No. It's, hey, for these five, let's give them a little flexibility. Take 20% of their smallest budget line items and help consolidate. So it's still within the realm of what Congress is appropriating for that broad <laughs> capability area and then dozens of smaller areas, but gives a little flexibility to do more portfolio investing that you couldn't have predicted three years out. But then the big one is in the acquisition and contracting area. So again, breaking from the program centric to look at the broader portfolio. So how can we shape a portfolio strategy where we're getting multiple vendors regularly competing for these capabilities that they're going to leapfrog each other in delivering solutions, that they're going to you know, integrate into a more open architecture, we're going to leverage common platforms and infrastructure and enterprise services, all to deliver that integrated suite of capabilities. <clears throat> and one of the beauties of it is, as Whitney highlights with the, the valley of death of how much gets wasted, if you have a portfolio, it's going to be easier to capture emerging tech coming from defense or industry into a portfolio than trying to force it into a stovepipe program. The, the two other big ones in the acquisition area is scaling the SDA model. So Space Development Agency just had a successful launch of Tranche Zero. Uh, we're very bullish on where SDA is these days to not only disrupt defense, uh, defense space acquisition, but also space operations. So let's break from the model of we're going to spend billions of dollars, you know, take a decade to build what General Hyten always called big juicy targets. Let's build many smaller things, get many vendors on a rapid iterative scale and move out on a, a key mission or capability area. So how do we apply that model elsewhere? You know, where can we get a modern day Rickover, empower them to move out on some key areas, someone who knows the tech and operations, and empower them with certain authorities <clears throat> of acquisition, contracting, hiring, test and certification, and say, go take this hill, go move out. Mm -hmm. So whether it could be you know, naval autonomy, Air Force CCA, energetics, you know, pick some you know, priority areas ideally targeted towards the Indo-PACOM theater to move out. And then the third big one is looking at the requirements process. So we've, we've you know, reformed acquisition for decades. We're finally getting after PPBE reform. The third big leg in the stool is the requirements process. We can't spend years and years writing requirements documents and going through a very bureaucratic process because that will just set up the acquisitions to fail. So let's take a hard look at all the processes, reviews, the documents, uh, aggressively streamline it. We still have tension between you know, joint staff from a top-down directive says, hey, we've got to fight as a joint force. We've got to be interoperable to do JATC2. But then we need the bottoms up uh, for the services provided individual capabilities. And have a more iterative approach of here are the operational needs and here's the tech opportunities. So a much more iterative, dynamic approach. So those were the three big ones in, in the acquisition domain. Yeah. So in the report, um, we say that the US industrial base has shrunk by 40% in the last decade, 40%. <clears throat> so that's 5% every year for the last five years. Um, what is the problem there? <laughs> is that a problem? And what are some of the ways in which the commission um, has sought to address that problem set and incentivize more partners to want to work with the Department of Defense? Yeah, it absolutely is a challenge. Uh, we definitely want to harness the technical talent and expertise from American <coughs> companies beyond and get them involved in providing defense solutions. 
So it goes to the incentives and, and barriers. So from an incentive perspective, for all the venture-backed, private equity-backed companies, you know, incentivizing them with a one to five million dollar, you know, research or prototype contract, you know, may help some. But it's that hundred million dollar plus production contract that that's really going to incentivize them to put money towards this. So at a strategic level, where are we putting our money? You know, historically in the 1990s to 2010s, we were spending roughly 61 percent on procurement versus RDT&E. But the last few years, we've shifted more towards like a 50-50 breakout. Mm -hmm. So when we say, hey, we want to harness commercial technology, but we're almost going to put 50 percent of our investment dollars in defense R&D, mm -hmm. there's, there's trade space. Um, so it's, you know, where we're incentivizing, you know, going after cost accounting systems. We want, you know, novel tech companies to come do business with DOD. Hey, go set up a separate accounting system just so DOD can you know, audit your books. Um, looking at SAM.gov, you know, the main website for you to find government opportunities. It's an archaic government website. You need a training program to understand how to use what should be a search engine. Uh, going through security clearance uh, backlogs for individuals and, and facilities. And then having folks in the department really championing the rapid contracting and acquisition strategies to say, here's how you really adopt them and get broader uh, adoption throughout the ranks to say, no, let, you know, if we want to exploit commercial solutions, here's how to go about doing it. So what, one of the things that was really important to us in this commission was it was not just having folks on the policy side and folks on the industry side, but certainly elevating the voices of, of war fighters themselves, right? Because all, everything we're talking about today has an impact on um, war fighters and they should have and, and do have a voice in this process. So to go back, um, Whitney, to uh, acquisition pathways, one of the recommendations seeks to tie experimentation to acquisition outcomes. Can you say a little bit more about that and the genesis of that recommendation? Yeah, so obviously we believe really strongly in the importance of experimentation, whether that's forces generating new concept of operations, uh, using existing capabilities in different ways, or identifying gaps that we need to source new co novel capabilities to fill. Um, but what we didn't want to do, and what the commission was very careful in not doing against our, against our worst impulses, was to stand up something new, a new initiative, a new organization um, that we thought was going to solve all of our problems, uh, which sometimes happens. We stand up something new to address a problem Problem, and sometimes we're just draining resources away from existing initiatives. Um, we were also cognizant at not wanting to support what's sometimes called uh, experimentation or innovation theater, where we really can't draw a line between the exercise and a tangible outcome that justifies the activity. Um, we wanted to make sure that experimentation was strongly tied to successful acquisition outcomes, those that are properly resourced and scaled. Um, so we looked at existing successful initiatives, whether that's the Navy's scout program, uh, RIMPAC, r and &E, uh, Raider Fund, uh, specifically initiatives that are focused on deterring the PRC. Of course, DOD and industry invest significant resources uh, to make sure that you know, we're able to demonstrate emerging capabilities and operationally relevant um, you know, uh, environments. Um, but even after a major exercise, uh, when everyone agrees on what the successful capabilities were, there's still that two to four uh, year lag time for DOD to formally define requirements, secure funding, uh, shape acquisition and contract strategies. Uh, for example, even successful capabilities um, identified in r &E's Raider Fund still go through the POM and the DMAG process. So to help ensure that these really well-validated capabilities can rapidly scale and field, we recommended piloting um, a fund of $250 million to scale operationally relevant technologies demonstrated at these exercises, meant to significantly you know, shorten the traditionally long lag times uh, for successful vendors to receive funding while DOD finalizes things like requirements on their end. And then in the, in the spirit of picking winners, we also recommended that these funds be allocated to five or fewer very high potential solutions to make sure that successful uh, vendors are properly resourced to actually be able to scale and deliver. <laughs> it was a bad time to take a mm. sip of water. Um, thank you, Winnie. So two major things that continually came up in our, in our conversations was, one, how do we scale? And two, how do we better leverage um, capital market funding to solve some of these challenges? Um, a recent op-ed, um, and I should remember the name, but I don't have the name, uh, cited that there were $64 billion of private capital funding in the US alone. 
That's three times the size of the US economy. So what were some of the takeaways from those conversations and, and how did we seek to address that as part of the commission? Yes, we were very preoccupied with the scaling challenge. Um, two, two of the recommendations that tried to tackle that challenge was one, uh, to generate direct phase three SIBRs in which early uh, successful performers that already have phase one SIBRs can be fast tracked to those more flexible contracts um, that have no limits of dollar size for procurement and all the other flexibility that comes along with phase three SIBRs. We also wanted to direct the SIBR offices of the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps to pilot the strategic funding increase um, program that's been leveraged so successfully by the Air Force. And that really helps bridge the valley of death between the phase two and the phase three SIBRs. And ultimately what this really does is just put more money on the table for vendors, around 60 million, so they can demonstrate more fulsomely what they can do for the department. Um, a lot of the vendors that have been deemed successfully cross the valley of death have come from this program. Um, and this also comes back to picking winners. Um, you know, candidly, $60 million is a rounding error for the department. If companies are not successfully delivering on that, they're not going to be in the federal space for very long. But the potential gain is really meaningful here. So um, we recommend picking winners, backing them meaningfully, and see what they can deliver. And we think more often than not, the department will be really pleased with the results. You also mentioned capital markets, um, which I think all of the... And I just to correct myself, yeah. <laughs> I said billion. I meant trillion. Yes. $64 trillion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to so clear. even more we're not using. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think the commission all really agreed that this was sort of an underutilized strategic advantage, not only of the United States, but specifically, you know, how can the department be using this? Um, we wanted to leverage capital markets in a couple ways. One, we wanted to increase the competition and sort of the aperture of tech that's being considered by the department. Um, we also wanted to increase the amount of capital market funds that's being aligned to department missions. Um, and we also thought that this would have the added benefit of helping increase those touch points and exposure um, of next generation tech to the end user. So to increase competition, uh, we recommended to remove the barrier of a company that's more than 50% uh, backed by VC to be able to compete for SIBRs. Uh, we don't want to punish successfully growing companies that are rewarded with more backing to then not be able to uh, use that pathway to deliver to the department. We also wanted to recommend removing the barrier that prevents companies that meet the requirements of a small business, but they're being publicly traded to compete for SIBRs. Um, small, high-tech R&D firms have to go public to you know, continue to be able to raise money um, for what's typically very capital-intensive technologies. And so by disallowing them from competing for SIBRs, I think DOD is sort of cutting themselves off from accessing uh, some of the most tech-proficient corners of the industrial base. And then the last thing we, we talked about with uh, capital market funding is to drive well-aligned tech adoption. Um, it's recommending that the Office of Strategic Capital leverage exter uh, external capital market funding for pilot projects. So this would see each service R&D organization identify two novel use cases in one or more of R&E's deep tech areas, uh, which are quantum technology, biotechnology, and advanced materials that could be leveraged to achieve service missions. Um, this recommendation was really born out of a desire not only to leverage you know, capital market funding better, but to address a lot of common challenges we see in tech adoption in general. One is what I mentioned earlier, just that general lack of understanding around tangible applications of tech. Um, two, the lack of connection between a lot of the great R&D that exists, whether you know, explicitly backed by the government or not, and connecting that you know, to the commercialization of the technology to revel relevant products and services. And then the third, what we see so often is we have these successful examples of tech adoption, um, but we're lacking what's sometimes called that catcher smit on the other end that prevents the end user from really being able to leverage what probably someone painstakingly got over the valley of death to begin with. You know, we hear, well, this really isn't in my con op. It's not in my training module. I don't know how to use it. Um, and it sounds great, and I believe that it does what you say it does, but uh, I don't have the manpower to sort of keep up with the policy guidance for this. So the juice just isn't worth the squeeze for me. Thanks, but no thanks. So ultimately, our vision for these pilot projects is to begin socializing use cases of deep tech so end users can more tangibly understand their respective benefits or shortcomings uh, to their needs. 
It also has the byproduct of providing additional funding and incentives for deep tech companies to continue to commercialize their technology because they get these really great robust, robust feedback and optimization loops. Um, and then lastly, to ensure when and if the tech is adopted, we do have that catcher's mitt in place. R&D leaders of these pilots should be uh, reporting to DIU and R&E at the end of the pilot's completion and say whether it was useful. Maybe the answer is no, we need something more resilient. Maybe it was useful, but we need to get the price down. Um, but if the capability that you got was useful and you wanted to adopt it tomorrow, sort of what would be our challenges, right? Does this capability fall through traditional seams of acquisition? Um, do we have the right talent to manage it? Do we have the right data management tools and strategy? Um, do we have the right digital infrastructure to test and evaluate this technology um, at scale? So the goal cumulatively here is to make sure that we're promoting well-aligned tech adoption um, that has that catcher's mitt at the end and hopefully on relevant timelines. So I've got some great audience questions coming in. I just encourage people to, to continue to submit some and we should have enough time to, to get to quite a few. Um, so you mentioned um, there, Whitney, leveraging capital market players, but I know Another related focus um, that, that came up a lot was making sure that we're more uh, appropriately leveraging all of the non-traditional yeah. defense ecosystem. Can you say more about that and, and how that gels with the recent um, announcement to elevate DOD's um, defense innovation uh, unit that, that Secretary James mentioned to a direct report of the Secretary of Defense? Congratulations on that, by <laughs> the way. Um, Thank you. Our, our fourth recommendation was really to elevate the Defense Innovation Unit um, and really resource it effectively to align and harness what the 2022 NDS calls the 21st century industrial base. Um, and so we were so pleased to see that DIU was recently realigned as a direct report to the uh, SECDEF. Um, our vision for DIU2 was not only to elevate it, we didn't want to just kind of move it square on an org chart, but we really had a vision for an expanded role that's complementary to OSD, ANS, and OSD R&E. Uh, you know, ANS does a tremendous job of contending uh, with industrial policy, uh, and R&E is so proficient at harnessing our traditional, you know, industrial base. We saw DIU as playing a role in filling the gap of an organization that can more um, dedicate itself to better aligning the non-traditional and the commercial industrial space. And so in that role, we see it not only sourcing you know, novel capabilities, um, but really leveraging all of what the non-traditional industrial base has to offer, whether that's due diligence, tech horizon scanning, um, you know, market intelligence, holistic tech landscape analysis. So it's not only meant to engage with potential vendors, um, but you know, private equity firms, venture capital firms, other, other transaction consortiums. Um, and we also want DIU to be adequately resourced, right, to not only be collecting that intel, but we want them kind of pushing it down in the department, making it accessible um, through regular engagements with S&T labs, PEOs, service R&D organizations, the combatant commands, um, and conversely, taking their challenges and pushing them back out to the private sector uh, just to facilitate better transparency about the kinds of problems that the department is hoping to solve. And you know, just a foot stomp that DIU's part in this can't be done in a vacuum. Um, we really see DIU, ANS, r &E, and their service partners uh, collaborating in lockstep about how to communicate with all of the industrial base um, about the department's needs and planned investments. We also recommend, you know, to this end, that DIU be resourced with new billets from the services rather than funding for contractors. Um, these billets would be priority assignments uh, selected from relevant PEOs and SAEs to better normalize and standardize sort of working with commercial partners across acquisition officials. We see DIU as having a lead role in better harnessing um, the non-traditional industrial base, but we also want them to take a role in empowering other corners of the department as well uh, to more quickly adopt commercial solutions. So to that end, um, we're also uh, recommending they charter a team uh, to streamline the processes, reviews, 
and documents for acquiring commercial solutions. This would reinforce the buy before build mentality, um, especially in the early phases of programs by baking it into their acquisition strategies. Um, and also worked basically just to develop a broader set of rapid funding tools uh, and approaches that are more consistent with the speed of commercial innovation cycles. And the ultimate goal would be for this to culminate in a comprehensive um, guide or pathway that could be leveraged by other corners of the department as well. Okay. Um, so another very timely topic is budgeting reform, um, which you discussed, Pete, um, when talking about collaboration with the Hill, which is a super, super important element um, that has featured in many of our discussions and, and in the recommendations. Um, and we were fortunate enough to, to benefit from Eric Lofgren's br uh, brilliance, because um, he led a lot of the, the, the budget um, analysis and recommendations that came up in, in the report. Um, Budget reform is especially timely given uh, the PPB uh, reform commission that's being conducted concurrently and we are lucky that two of our commissioners are also sat on that commission so we could really benefit um, from their expertise in that area. So Pete, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the recommendations that, that we address um, in relation to budget reform? Sure, absolutely. And absolutely kudos to Eric Lofgren for, for leading the charge on all this. Mm -hmm. A lot of the budget reform is really on rebuilding the trust between the department and the Hill on where to invest you know, significant amount of capital for national security. Uh, you, you talk about the, the you know, long timelines it takes to go through and develop and pass the budget. You know, where are we going to you know, go through the various committees? Uh, so our focus is really on how do you strike the right balance of the speed and agility that the department needs to keep up with changing operations, threats, technology, risks, and, and the like with the you know, oversight and insight that Congress requires. So we had you know, three main recommendation areas. The first is on consolidating program elements and budget line items. So when you look at the $300 million in rdt and &E procurement that DOD spends, they're broken down into 1,700 different budget accounts. The median size of that is down to $38 million. I think there's something around 700 of them are below $20 million. So we, we fully appreciate congressional oversight, but when we're getting down to the 10 to $15 million accounts for a $30, $300 billion budget, it, it, it's, uh, it's excessive. And we even looked at if you added up around 380 of the smallest RDT&E accounts, that equals the B21 account. So 380 mm -hmm. to one. Mm -hmm. So uh, part of what we recommend is you know taking a look, have uh, DOD staff, including the CDAO, the new uh, data and AI organization, work with the appropriation staff and say, let's consolidate 200 a year for the next three years. Where you're going to merge, you're still going to stay within the broader portfolio area, but let's merge the smaller ones, the ones that are more dynamic, that you're not going to be effectively able to plan two to three years out. Mm -hmm. So that you know, the department still has some flexibility to shift within key areas, and there's still going to be constraints, but uh, enables uh, greater flexibility but then still providing Congress the appropriate insights. Mm -hmm. Related to that is going after reprogramming authorities. So right now the limit is $10 million or 20%, whichever is lower. So when we're talking about these small accounts already, we're, we're talking about moving seven or $8 million at best. So we said, you know, let's revisit that to right now, you have to go through a lengthy process of the services, then OSD, then OMB, then the Hill, all have to approve a reprogramming authority, reprogramming above that threshold. Right now, it's, it, it's, been it's been more and more constrained where now you have to have prior approval from all four defense committees before you can move that money. And that could take six to nine months to go through the DOD and congressional process. So we said, let's flip it back to the historical norms that Eric, being the historian, was always great about, to say, you know, 30-day notification. So within that window, Congress can still ask for a briefing for more information or flat out reject it but at least we're able to move out a little further. Related to that is new starts. So as we identify you know, new emerging technology that we want to move out on, I can't tell a tech company, that's great. Sit right there in two to three years, we'll get some budget and come back and maybe we'll buy it. Yeah. So there are things where you could do a letter notification to Congress and, and kind of you know, get stuff in there. $10 million, RDT and E, $20, billion, $20 million in procurement. Again, it's that prior approval. So let's shift it to that 30-day notification. Oh, no, for this one, it's actually for the entire effort. So when we're talking that mm. small dollar amount for the entire effort, it, it's a rounding error. So if we say for that fiscal year, that's at least lets us get started 
and then you can go through the normal budget process for follow-on years. And Congress could still veto any new starts. And then the third big one is modernizing the budget docs. So when we send the budget over to the Hill each year, it's 30,000 pages. So think of six giant copier paper boxes manually delivered for the budget. Mm -hmm. So think about the time and energy it takes for the services to develop those pages, then go through OSD, OMB, and over to the Hill, and then for congressional staffs to review it. So now we wonder why we have continu continuing resolutions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we said, you know, let's take a modern approach. Let's get, you know, the teams <laughs> together, work through a more streamlined approach, you know, maybe a six-page budget doc that out outlines the core elements, but then has links to, you know, the emerging databases and the quarterly reports. So now Congress has more timely information. Because we know when Congress knows when we send it over, uh, it, there's so many changes that have taken effect but don't reflect in the current budget. So there's hundreds of calls back and forth. But we have more timely budgets that they could then deep dive into individual programs. This could be much more effective. So it's striking the right balance of the speed and agility with more timely and effective insight uh, is the, what we need for PPE reform. Yeah, super. Um, I'm going to turn to some audience questions now. Um, the first one I have here is from Warren Bayless. Um, and Warren says, there have been so many defense acquisition reforms on both sides of the Atlantic during the last 20 years, and all have arguably failed. <clears throat> what is the one thing that needs to happen for this current worthy initiative to succeed? So, so you're asked, what's our silver bullet? Just one? <laughs> I'll just start by saying I think some of the challenge of tackling defense innovation challenges is that it's all so intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you have this really great capability, you know, as Pete mentioned, the requirements process uh, is very long. Let's say you get through that and you say, well, I just kind of want to mess around this this AI software on my computer. And your, your leadership says, I, I don't know if we have authority to do that and I don't know who to ask if we have authority to do that. And let's say we get authority to, to do that and start experimenting with this AI software where there's a good chance that um, the IT that you're using isn't sufficient or compatible with this new AI software. And so you can take sort of any anecdote of, of where it went wrong, and you really can't point to one problem. Many times it's very layered and interrelated. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're, there's ever going to be a smoking gun, um, but I think we were really uh, careful to look at this holistically from a 360-degree view um, and make sure that we were trying to tackle you know, a lot of these major components that sort of get in the way? For me, it always start, I always start with the why. So the yeah. national security threat, if you're not paying attention to you know, deterring China, um, then you know, we'll, we'll get you into some classified briefings and, and understand the threat. And we've always done that you know, when, it, when it's getting partners in you know, contracting tests, you know, any organization within the community that isn't fully baked into the model, we bring them into threat briefings, read them in, and they get it, and they say, okay, now let's figure out how to go about doing it. So for all of this, yeah, we could nitpick any you know, key element of the bureaucracy, but getting you know, congressional uh, leaders are, are fully aware of this and are echoing the, the key challenges. Defense officials are, are um, clearly conveying it. So it's now that you have that clear objective, it's getting uh, partners together to figure out how to go about tackling them. Yeah, and I do think I think our next panel is gonna is going to get into that a lot. Um, but I I do think you know this certainly isn't the only effort talking about about these challenges. I mean there are quite a lot of um, different uh, groups with working on similar issues, maybe saying slightly different things in DC and and um, in allied nations. I think. We're all, we all know what the problem is. We all want to address it. So how do we go about really taking that groundswell of support um, and, and turning that into some action? So hopefully our recommendations will help some yes. folks get that. Um, OK, so we have a, an audience member um, here with us ask, how can foreign technology companies with innovative solutions be <coughs> included in the potential change in acquisition and contracting processes with the Department of Defense? So, so a lot of our stuff has been very focused on the US um, defense ecosystem. How do we go about, a really important element, is including allies and partners in that doing capability development um, together. I think AUKUS as a, as a structure has been really fantastic news to see, especially pillar two. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? I'll start off by saying, um, you know, this was 
part of the fine print in the DIU recommendation too, is like we don't just want to be looking at our national innovation base, but can we be sourcing um, trusted parts, microchips, anything, kind of capabilities, uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, technology that's coming from trusted allies that we can be leveraging as well. So we really should be looking at this more holistically. Um, and I think a lot of that is in the spirit of not finding ourselves in another situation in five years where we need another unprecedented bill um, to get us out of something we sort of wandered in uh, to not realizing. I'd say this is also a really good example of how the policy struggles to keep up with the technology. Um, I know particularly for things like biotechnology and quantum, uh, again, like very capital intensive technologies, they really want to work with international partners of, of allies. Um, but it's just unclear in terms of ITAR and what kind of technologies you're allowed to work with and sell with. Um, and so I do think that's another major challenge is how can policy keep up with the pace of commercial technology so we can be better harnessing uh, allies' technology. Yeah, we definitely discussed the international cooperation uh, amongst the commission. Maybe it'll be in, in a follow-on report, uh, but definitely with AUKUS, you know, going after ITAR reform, you know, it, it's clear we need to move together, you know, with our allies and partners. You know, while DOD decades ago was the center of center of the world for R and D, now it's increasingly commercial and international. So there's definitely how do we effectively tap that? But again, it's the ITAR related processes that are huge impediments that we really need a, a concerted effort to go after and, and break down those barriers. Well, you teed up nicely what I was going to say, which is, you know, we were very focused in this effort to, to, to just focusing on the U.S. defense industrial ecosystem. It is, it is huge in and of itself. Our follow-on work will actually be very much focused on um, international cooperation um, with allies. Um, so, Drew Majulis from... Um, uh, Rye Metal Defense asks, how do your recommendations help shore up wartime production capacity and surge readiness gaps revealed by the Ukraine conflict, particularly as the industrial base has consolidated dramatically over the past decade? I'll start by just saying, um, obviously, we were focused a lot on the non-traditional and commercial industrial base. And the umbrella under which you know we were doing this commission um, is the urgency of this idea that if we are going to face a conflict in, in the coming years, that doesn't give us enough time to lean on the tra traditional industrial base to create new things. And so really, our strategic advantage could come from these commercial technologies if we're able to adopt them on relevant timelines. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I know the department's really been moving out on, you know, focusing on replenishing munition stocks. Uh, but even with the surge capability, we're still years out. So mm -hmm. it, it's an aggressive, uh, we're still far behind where we need to be. So this is getting at the underpinning from some of the budget requirements, flexibility, some of the, just the culture. So we don't get into that habit, uh, you know, we don't fall into a similar trap with other capability areas going forward. Um, there's no silver bullet to address the munition shortage overnight, mm -hmm. uh, but getting more players in the game to look at alternate strategies to achieve those desired operational effects, uh, given the unique uh, domain of the Pacific, uh, we definitely need to replenish stocks. So we hit on uh, some of the key areas, but it's not going to be a man magic bullet to then say we're going to have replenish stocks yeah. overnight. So we have um, a question here from Rob Murray, who I, I know, thanks for being here, Rob, um, worked at NATO for a long time. So he asked, do you believe that the Office of Strategic Capital should formally partner with NATO's new innovation fund, which is a, a $1 billion venture capital fund, um, which the US decided not to be a part of? What are your thoughts on that, if any? Yeah, my impression is that they're not part of the Innovation Fund, but they are part of Diana, which I was grateful mm -hmm. to see, the more experimental part of it versus the Venture Fund. I think, too, we're still very much in the early stages of figuring out, you know, what sort of VC models, venture capital models are we trying to uh, do ourselves? What's complementary of what's already being done? Are we duplicating what mm. other folks are doing? Uh, do we need a venture capital fund that, you know, focuses mostly on defense capabilities? And so I think it's it makes sense that a lot of these major organizations are dipping their toe into it because they, it is a successful model. Um, I think these organizations should think really critically about what's complementary and what's duplicative and letting uh, various organizations sort of 
double down in what they're specializing in and what they're good in. I think both the Innovation Fund and the Office of Strategic Capital are still so much in the early days. Um, so let's definitely see what happens in the first couple of years, what they're able to do, relative strengths and weaknesses. Um, but I, I would assume they'd be closely engaged. I would hope so. She's so perfect. Um, so we have a question here. Have you, uh, from David Schiff, sorry, sorry, David. Uh, have you recommended streamlined search tools for industry that would allow them to more quickly find defense <clears throat> requests for proposals, requests for information, BAAs, um, and small business innovation research grants? Yeah, so I mean, with a lot of this, you know, we talk about um, digital transformation. There are huge opportunities across the department and, you know, GSA and OMB and from a federal government perspective. Uh, when you look at leading tech companies and you say, hey, you have, you know, key solutions to offer, but then use some of these old websites that, you know, a uh, basic search feature isn't, isn't uh, effective, you know, we really need some UI, UX, you know, get uh, USDS, Digital Defense Service, uh, in there to do some UI, UX design to really reshape, you know, both the big solicitations, you know, all the small different funds. It's how do you organize all of that? For industry, you know, hey, the, the large traditional primes, you know, have a good, uh, they've invested the resources to track all that down. For the startups, the scale ups, the non traditionals, they don't have the time, energy, and resources to go track down 15 different websites and figure out how to use them. So, yeah, more is needed to invest to, you know, curate all this to help navigate the innovation ecosystem and, and the opportunity space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have an audience member has asked, can you please discuss how the US Department of Defense should deal with the challenge of US firms developing tech with foreign partners, for example, in quantum technology? Uh, did we address export controls, constraints, and reform uh, in, our, in our report? I think most companies understand where that red line is. Uh, maybe greener companies uh, might not understand, for example, partnering with a Singaporean university that also China partners with, maybe that. Um, but I don't think um, in this globalized world you can sort of claim ignorance anymore. Uh, and I think that paradigm is very much shifting. Um, and I, I think that the government's doing a good job in trying to make as clear as possible what those red lines are. Um, there's definitely still a lot of work to be done. I think there's a lot of large companies that sort of can't really trace their, their parts and capabilities past, you know, down three, four suppliers, and that's still a major challenge. Um, but again, I do think that's one of the challenges is like, is policy keeping up with tech? I talked to someone uh, and they said, you know, we, there's this new kind of biomanufactured rubber and it might be really helpful for, for testing and evaluating hypersonic. Should we ban selling it abroad? This is really granular, like tough stuff. Um, and that there's a tremendous amount of gray area. Um, so I think it's something we'll be working on for the foreseeable future. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even with our closest allies, you know, Australia, we see a lot of even leading U.S. tech companies, you know, doing business in Australia. And then there's opportunities where they're developing emerging tech, emerging solutions. But, you know, where's an opportunity space for, you know, DOD and American companies to work with them on evolving this technology. But you can't touch it because then then becomes ITAR tainted. So we really have to go after you know, streamlining that to enable greater opportunity space. You know, and we have our closest allies, our Five Eyes partners, uh, members of NATO, where there's huge opportunities for collaboration. We need to break down those barriers. Yeah. Um, so probably our final audience question um, is by Ali Javahiri. Apologies if I did not pronounce your name properly. Um, Ali asks, how do technology readiness levels influence funding requirements for the 14 critical technology areas? Um, Furthermore, how can private actors in the ecosystem, such as venture capitalists or even the, the prime defense companies um, looking at acquisitions, utilize TRL frameworks to determine the level of capitalization required to move critical technologies to a mission ready stage? I don't think there's a lot of hard and fast rules. I think there's a lot of folks that are excited about the promise of lower TRL and something that they can build concurrently. I think some folks are really ready for something that's ready to deploy um, and has been battle tested. Um, so I don't think there's hard and fast. I really think it depends on the end user and the specific capability that's being brought to bear. Um, although the question probably raises a good point that the department should be a bit more transparent about that. Um, and that's what we really tried to get at with our DIU recommendation. Uh, 
process, how can we just be clear about where to plug in, um, given your, your tech area, given how mature or immature it is? Um, we could definitely be working on more transparency with that. So I, we're nearing the end of our time. I want to kind of ask you maybe two, two final questions to round us off. Um, one, what is the role of Congress in enabling a lot of these changes that, that we put in into the report, the recommendations. In, in what ways can Congress be a champion um, for increasing innovation um, in the Pentagon? And, and what are the um, perhaps potential roadblocks kind of inhibiting um, uh, that? Yeah, so Congress has been a great partner with the Department over the last few years. When you look at the NDAs, you know, really moving forward on here's some more flexibilities, here are new authorities, go out and move fast. Uh, a huge partnership to say they understand the threat and have empowered DOD to move out quicker. Uh, when we've engaged with the Hill over the last few months, uh, meeting with members and staff, it, there's been a very positive reception to these recommendations. They align with what you know, many of the congressional leaders have been saying over the last few years. And then even the last few weeks, we hear members speaking in public, echoing a lot of the um, key themes from our draft report. So we, we see huge opportunities to influence the 24 NDAA and appropriations bill. Uh, with any engagement, there's always going to be you know, some critics for some areas that will nitpick. But I think you know, a majority of them have some, have some promise. You've got to get through four committees and, and two parties. But I think you know, in general, uh, there's been a huge re uh, receptivity to, to these recommendations. So, innovation adoption can seem like a very intractable issue. I think we've all talked about the decades worth of different efforts that, that have uh, focused on it. And I think a lot of the cultural um, shifts that, that, that need to be um, made to achieve some of these things, can, they're really challenging. It's not easy, right? But our commission, I think, has given me a lot of hope because we've got together a uh, a real collective of people who have the will to overcome these challenges. So Whitney P, we've got a lot of recommendations in this report. There's a lot that we didn't even get to put in the report. Um, do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave us with? Um, you're right, a lot got put on the cutting room floor and I think it's gonna be something that we're all working on for years to come. It'll keep us gainfully employed. But no, I think that the work is, is never done. Um, I think too, one thing I've really enjoyed about you know this commission is that so often um, in this space, sometimes what it ends up being is a bit of a, a knife fight and, and blaming. Um, and the conversation sometimes gets reduced in a way that sort of pits you know traditional um, industrial players versus non-traditional or DoD against certain parts of the industrial base. Um, and I think that really obscures kind of like the more nuanced picture of what's happening on the ground, which is you have hundreds, if not thousands, of really um, motivated and mission-driven folks in all corners of the tech and national security space uh, working together towards an objective. Um, like you said, these problems are so complex and they're so hard, um, but I think we can do hard things. And I think a lot of these problems elicit a lot of justified frustration. Um, I'm just grateful that people throw their hands up in frustration and then come back to work the next day and continue to tackle these hard problems. Um, and so it's been really refreshing to me. And like Pete said, I, I think we really look forward to continuing to try to get a lot of these implemented um, and workshop some of the other cutting room floors because there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, our, our co-chairs were very adamant about they had to be concise and actionable. So, you know, we really, we didn't want to write just another report to add to the pile. We wanted, you know, action for this. So, you know, the first half of it, you know, is legislation is part of it. So you can have the perfect NDA or, or probes language. The next part is someone in, in the department. You have to have the leadership to champion it and say, yes, we're going to move out on it, and then the staffs to go execute it. That always gets overlooked, that, you know, it's, it's the implementation and then the continuous improvement. So uh, we look to partner with, with both Congress and the, and, the, and the Pentagon to implement these solutions. Yeah, super. Well, thank you both for the tremendous amount of work that went into writing this report. I really encourage everyone here in person to grab a copy. We have copies outside. For those online, we have a virtual, uh, virtual copy. Um, next, we are going to transition over to our fantastic second panel, which um, includes our distinguished co-chairs and some of our commissioners. And it will be moderated by the formidable Steve Rodriguez, who's our project director. So just bear with us while we transition over um, and, and join us in a moment.
you. Come on up. Come on. Hey, Linda. I have a tech more in the crowd. We're going to direct all the hard questions to you. Good? Okay. I'm not worried. All right, thank you, uh, thank you everyone for uh, uh, taking your seats again in what is probably the fastest coffee break in uh, DC history. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, my panelists, co-chairs, and uh, commissioners for joining me. Uh, a couple observations before we get rolling. One, what I, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Under Secretary Ellen, Ellen Lord, uh, Hondo Gertz, Bob Work, and Nick Sinai as well, some of our commissioners who were particularly active in the sausage making of the report that you may have in your hands or for those of you online who are, are reading. Um, it may sound great to have a bunch of extremely uh, senior individuals uh, on a commission, but then getting, getting everyone on the same page uh, is a different matter. And I would, I would point out that we have uh, unity, uh, to use an old uh, West Point term, uh, unity on the uh, recommendations between the commissioners and I dare I say also uh, bipartisan. Uh, it was uh, definitely debates over the issues and not over uh, the intent behind uh, said issues. So I think that's a rarity. One other thing I would point out, uh, and this was something that we highlighted at the outset of the commission, it was noted that if this commission happened just a couple years earlier, the commissioners, especially on the commission, would not have had nearly the depth of understanding that they do now, right? Now we have eight years after the launch of the third offset strategy, we have a series of government officials who are uh, steeped, in some cases, whether they wanted to or not, in defense technology. They're now on the boards of major tech companies. They're involved in venture capital or private equity funds uh, to uh, a degree that even just a few short years ago, the level of understanding and the depth of discussion around these uh, specific issues would not have uh, been nearly as, uh, frankly, useful. So uh, I think we're lucky to have, uh, maybe being better lucky than good, having uh, the level of understanding the, the concise recommendations that we came up with. Uh, so let's, uh, let's get started here. We have, uh, I'll start first with Undersecretary Michelle Flournoy. Um, she, what I, what I find impressive about her background, apart from being as off-sited the uh, former Undersecretary of Policy, you're also a multi-time founder, right? West Exec, Center for New American Security, I which can't we- can't find anybody to hire me, so I have to create That's my right. own job. And, and we generally try not to mention CNAS in this, yeah. in this audience, yeah. but uh, um, we're all about uh, giving out plaudits today. So uh, let me start with a, a first question with you. What does the commission need to be looking at going forward when it comes to ensuring leading technology companies are rapidly uh, evaluated by DOD, right? Yeah, well, I, I wanna say thank you to the Atlantic Council, to all of the folks who were involved in putting this together, um, and to our, our co-chairs uh, who brought us great leadership. Um, I've never seen something like this come together so fast. And I think part of it was just the sense of urgency that we all feel like we do not have a lot of time here and we have got to change um, the speed uh, with which we are able to adopt innovation if we're going to maintain a strong deterrent and our ability to prevail uh, amid, amidst the strategic competition. And we can get more into that. Um, but I think, you know, I think these recommendations are, are really powerful and they're a great starting point. But in my view, the follow-on work is really in two areas, um, and this is where the department often stumbles in terms of going from good policy into real execution. First is the human capital piece. We have got to train, we've got to recruit and train people who have a greater technological fluency. We have to have more exchange between the customer and the, you know, the, the, the companies that are um, uh, ready to step up and provide mm -hmm. cutting edge capabilities. And, key, and the key piece is we have to change the risk profile, the risk aversion. I mean, the, I don't blame members of the acquisition course, core for being risk averse. I mean, think of people have gone to jail for violating the law. People have gotten hauled up to 
you know, be crucified before, you know, committees of Congress because they've misspent money or they've missed their budget, you know, their, their schedule targets. It, it, we, you know, we understand why people are risk averse. So if you're really going to change behavior, mm -hmm. You have to change the incentive structure. Mm -hmm. You have to reward people. You, first of all, you have to train them on the authorities that are available for them to use, the urgency of why we need to use them, um, what we're trying to get at, you know, sort of, the, uh, and, and where we're trying to go. And then you have to reward a change of behavior. You have to have promote, promote people for a difference. And here, you know, I'd mentioned Hondo Gertz was a great example. His, when he was uh, the Navy's acquisition officer or overseer, he made the acquisition officer of the year someone who moved really fast and first time failed, and then learned from that failure, tried again, and brought something new to the Navy with speed that was exceptional. So you, we have to hold up those examples of people who are willing to, to behave differently, mm. make sure they have promotion opportunities, make sure there are career paths. And then the last thing, more broadly, is the change management piece. You know, you don't get these hard changes in policy to really be executed without significant leadership from the top, all of you. <laughs> We've all experienced how hard that is. But just doggedly going after it, um, the incentive changes, the accountability, um, and, and pushing the system to realign to get to get things done. So I think human capital and change management, those are the two, along with working with our partners and allies, which is a key part of this. I think those are areas mm. of follow-up effort for us. So moving on, Secretary Esper, uh, one of your defining accomplishments that you mentioned in your opening remarks was the establishment of uh, Army Futures Command, right? How did those experiences inform uh, from your perspective, what the government needs to do to adopt innovation, and especially in the near term? Yeah, well, Futures Command was important because the four of us now, being myself, uh, General Mark Milley, who was the Chief of Staff of the Army, Ryan McCarthy, the Undersecretary of the Army, and then Jim McConville, who was the Vice, realized that we were at this critical moment in time where the, the equipment that was came into being during the Reagan era had mm -hmm. really had, it was reaching the end of its utility. And those big five weapon systems are still in use, right? The Black Hawk, the Abrams, the Bradley, mm -hmm. the uh, Patriot, and the Apache. And so we needed, to, we needed a new generation of weapon systems to deal with the Chinese threat. Uh, but to do that, we knew we couldn't get there with the system we had. And that was the genesis of, uh, of the establishment of Futures Command. And we look back at historical examples. I think earlier we talked about Rick Over and tried to come up with a model that, that was built around the cross-functional teams. Um, we knew, I knew, at least McCarthy and I came from industry, we knew the importance of predictability for industry. Sure. And so we agreed that we'd have six areas of focus and they would not change. And I, I give today's Army leadership credit. It's a, it's a different administration, but they have not changed those priorities, mm -hmm. and it's been five years now. And, um, and we had to make a number of other changes to kind of set something up that, that, that could move away from the, the, the bureaucratic tendencies of what was in the system at that time. And look, um, time will tell how successful it is. Y you know, here we are in the year 2023, and of the 32 original projects, I think, that we launched, uh, 24 of them will be prototyped or deployed this year. Mm -hmm. So 66%, that's pretty good batting average for, for the Army, and particularly at a time when its budget's been cut really hard. But look, I, I think the important thing here is this, and Michelle touched on the human capital management, and I, I keep coming back to this, and will, and that is the importance of leadership. I mean, Millie and McConville, McCarthy and I were willing to put our personal time into this to first scrub the budget and come up with the money and then to, and then to kind of go figure out where to put it. And I'm not saying that to pat ourselves on the back because my predecessor, Bob Gates, had to do the same thing during his tenure and others have done, had to do it. But it takes that personal leadership, spending that time. And I think when you're in a large organization like DOD where there is, such um, where the incentives don't exist sure. to, to, to do bold things or where, the, where it's uh, failure is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, I think the leaders have to bear that responsibility. They have to get personally involved, mm -hmm. get down in the trenches, be willing to carry that load, and, because they can. That's why they were uh, appointed and then confirmed in the first place, to carry that load and try and teach the bureaucracy a different way of do, doing business. To me, that's the critical component here that we need to see both in the Pentagon and on Capitol Hill, by the way, because otherwise, People go up to the hill, uh, they, they talk about their program being behind, and they become a political punching bag for people, I'm sorry, who are just trying to score 
political points. It ends up hurting the warfighter and our nation's security. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to figure out ways to get around that dynamic because you're not going to change that factor. Mm -hmm. But to me, it comes down to the human capital and then the leadership quotient. Well, that's a great segue to Secretary James. Uh, during a recent interview uh, celebrating the B-21 bombers uh, rollout, uh, you had an incredible quote, which uh, someone asked you, uh, in effect, ma'am, how did you, you know, which you, you initiated that program, how did you get that program uh, rolled out so quickly, in seven years, I believe? Uh, and you had a quote that said, we checked the checkers, checking the checkers. Yeah. Right. Which which that was never, rather eloquent on my part, don't you think? <laughs> and and which narrowly avoided becoming the 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 theme or the title of our uh, interim report. Yeah. Uh, uh, fortunately, I was overruled. Uh, so I I like this quote because of what I think what it signifies and gets a, a bit of what Secretary Esper was talking about as well. So I, I was hoping you could explain more what you meant by that, and especially with regard to many of the commission's recommendations, which are in fact aimed at driving innovation adoption. Right. So what I meant by uh, one of the reasons I thought the B-21 was going as well and moving more rapidly than other programs have in the past was because we chose to put it in one of those pockets of innovation for development that I spoke about, and that was the Air Force Rapid Capabilities Office. One of the things that the Rapid Capabilities Office does, and by the way, the SDA, the Space Development Agency, is on a similar track, and recall that one of our recommendations is we need to begin to fashion some of our other acquisition authorities and acquisition teams more in the direction of the way these, these uh, pockets of innovation are going. There are fewer checkers checking the checkers in these pockets of innovation. And by that, I mean the key decision makers serve as, we'll call them the board of directors. They're all at the same reviews. Um, and that speeds things up. That way, if people have questions, if they have issues, you get it all out on the table at roughly the same time. Vice, when I was secretary of the Air Force, an awful lot of the programs were still, major programs anyway, were still retained at the OSD level now, thanks to Secretary Lord and other efforts, a lot of those have gotten pushed down in the intervening mm -hmm. years. But if you've got OSD checking on things and then you've got the services checking on things, before you know it, you've got eight different offices, all of which are looking at the same program and somebody's got a question and that slows it down two more months and then somebody else says no about one element and that shuts the whole thing down for longer. So this is what I mean about many different offices and people, checkers, checking the checkers. By the way, big, big companies of which I've served as an executive in, in one, we sometimes have too much bureaucracy, too many checkers checking the checkers. Now that's not the only reason why I think the B-21 is going quite well. The B-21 was also designed to use mature technologies. Mm. By the way, buy instead of build, if there's mature commercial technologies that we think uh, can you know, do the trick for us, that's one of the recommendations and we hope DIU will become more involved with those decisions as an advocate. So mature technologies, um, that's another factor keep the requirements stable. So if anybody thinks the requirement on the B-21 needs to change in some way, you gotta rock it all the way up to the top. You cannot have the authority yourself at a lower level to make such a change. And guess what? The requirements have remained very stable. And then the last one that, that comes to mind is the fact that there's been a push to use open architectures, open mission systems, architecture so that as things inevitably do change, you can plug in mm. those changes without having to redo the whole darn program. So those are some of the B-21 lessons learned. And again, um, having those pockets of innovation like SDA, that is one of the key recommendations that we're calling for, that more acquisition groups do this. We're also calling for, um, I think, other areas that are going to be of great interest to smaller companies, the raising of the CAS thresholds, right. for example. I think that'll be um, enormously important. Opening up the aperture for more companies to be able to participate in SIBRs. Fast tracking companies through the SIBRs process. More money for actual uh, going into to production. Uh, the stepped up responsibilities that we're calling for, that DIU take on. We'll, we'll see whether the secretary likes those ideas or not, but we think that would be mm. a great a great step forward. And then lastly, if there's one part of this that does kind of worry me a bit, I will admit it's the part where we uh, talk about the budget reform and particularly where we're asking Congress to raise the reprogramming right. thresholds and do some portfolio management, mm -hmm. allow that additional flexibility. You know, it's transparency that they need. They want to have the trust, but they also have to be willing to let go of just a little bit of that control. 
a little bit of that power and a little bit of that control. And that's not easy for human beings. So that's the one part that worries me. But I, I hope because of the threat that they will lean forward and try some of these ideas. Can I just foot stomp that? Because I, I think the checking the checkers, check whatever, is great because the ultimate checkers are Congress. That's why we have, as Pete and Whitney said, 1,700 program lines, mm -hmm. reprogramming thresholds or whatever, $20 million. Right. You, you got to extend some trust and you got to be willing to accept some failures, some shortfalls. But, but right now we're tying DOD's hands too tightly. Mm -hmm. We're sending all the wrong messages. And I think if we want to be able to move quickly, then you got to give people the freedom to not just fail, but you got to give them the freedom to succeed. And we don't have that sure. right now. So th this is actually a theme that we discussed a, a lot in our commission deliberations, which was how to characterize the recommendations that we were putting forward. Uh, many past efforts to include the third offset st strategy to a degree, let's say unintentionally characterized uh, innovators, uh, uh, relationships with DOD and especially the defense industrial base is adversarial, and uh, particularly with the acquisition officials as well. So, uh, you. Me, particularly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and I think it's a relevant discussion, uh, especially teeing up under Secretary Lord. You were the uh, Pentagon's, as they call it, the chief weapons buyer, which is a, I, I would actually prefer that title as opposed to under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. Um, so, you, like uh, many of your numerous subordinates, are completely inundated, extraordinarily busy, overtaxed, and often put down by Congress or unintentionally by your, your leadership uh, as part of trying to do your job, especially faster, right? So I guess the question is, uh, given the focus of this commission is on driving defense innovation, right? A simil uh, similar familiar terms have been used before. Uh, how should extremely busy acquisition executives, uh, to Secretary Ian James and Secretary Esper's points earlier, uh, consider and, dare I say, adopt these recommendations that we're putting forward, like in the midst of their busy days that they're working through? Understood. Um, first, I just want to echo everyone else and say thank you to the Atlantic Council, your leadership, the entire team, the commissioner's leadership, and all the commissioners. I think this is important what we're doing. Also, I am one of two of those commissioners that's also on the PPBE, the Planning, Programming, Budgeting, and Execution, um, congressionally mandated commission, Peter Levine and I are. So I am speaking on my own behalf here, not spo um, speaking for the PPBE yeah, commission. All of that being said, what advice do I have um, for acquisition yeah, executives? Right. Embrace the moment. Mm -hmm. um, there has never been a more opportune time with the threats we see, whether it be near-peer competition from China, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a lot of other nefarious actors. There's obviously a burning platform out there. And now we have the entire community coming together and thinking about the problems of how do we move with speed. And mm -hmm. once we get through the planning, programming, and budgeting, it comes down to um, the uh, actually execution, which is acquisition. Right. So I say embrace this moment and communicate um, with leadership at DOD, on the Hill, um, industry associations, all the thought leaders um, in the DC community and beyond, but be very specific. So first of all, one of the challenges we all see is a lack of data specificity when talking about these programs. Mm. And often it's very difficult to get to the data, and this creates an enormous amount of tension between Congress and um, DOD. So I would say use this moment to talk about how we have to move from piles of paper to electronic databases mm. to allow both DOD and the Hill to be able to understand what the fact set is and make sure that those are updated um, on a frequent basis. Mm. This will increase the cadence of communications and really um, the value of those when it's fact-based. Secondly, delegate, 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 um, whether that be on 
the congressional side where very obviously um, members and staffers take their responsibilities very seriously and they believe they need to have a level of fidelity to have the right type of oversight. Mm. If they can obtain the data in an electronic format as appropriate to be disclosed um, to the Hill, then perhaps they can delegate authority back to the building with certain oversight. Mm. Additionally, um, in DOD, we need to delegate more. We've begun, but we have a long way to go because we all know those stacks of packages that move from slowly from office to office, desk to desk, um, are not me moving at the speed of relevance. And right now, we need to field capability very quickly. And then finally, the other um, theme that I pulled out of the commission's report that I think is important to the acquisition community is to start writing contracts. You do not build capacity and capability hmm. through R&D projects. And we all know that other than maybe nuclear propulsion, nuclear weapons, hypersonic weapons, most of the innovation is being done in the private sector. And so what we right. need to do is start putting out contracts so that we can build that capability um, for both ourselves and our allies and partners. Hmm. So uh, I want to stick with you. Uh, you were also, uh, before going into the government, were a CEO of Textron, a, a company that makes uh, helicopters, among many other things, and judging by recent news, a lot of helicopters. Uh, uh, you're putting your industry hat on now, right, which you had a, a long career in, in, in industry. Uh, how do you see our recommendations? We talked earlier about how do, how do these recommendations affect acquisition executives. How do you see these recommendations affecting um, industry's ability to support DOD in adopting leading tech solutions? I think it provides um, a foundation for having conversations with actionable items. Mm. So it's not only working with DOD, but talking <clears throat> to members and staffers mm. on the Hill about these, going to the industry associations again, talking in think tanks. It's giving um, industry a lexicon mm. within the realm of the doable. And often we have a hard time translating from policy to implementation guidance and what's mm. really statute policy and urban legend is very unclear to industry because they will be told emphatically by someone that this cannot be done, not always absolutely accurate. So I would take this document and use it to go and have some crucial conversations. Great. Uh, before I turn to Under Secretary Flournoy, uh, you both were also in major roles at uh, trade associations, right? Aer Aerospace Industries uh, Association. Yeah, and in industry, too. And in industry. Uh, and then you were at Benz, uh, uh, is that correct? That's right. So do you have any perspectives on this from a trade association perspective? I think there's really something in this report for everybody, for the trade associations, for the mm -hmm. large companies, for the small companies. Uh, everybody will benefit from uh, more rapid innovation of these sorts of technologies. And most of all, the United States government and the warfighter will, will benefit. So um, yeah. there's something in here for everybody, I think. If I could just interject, I think part of the power here is everybody being on message and echoing and amplifying the same thing. So mm -hmm. all these groups can speak with one voice in their own words. Mm -hmm. Great. So Under Secretary Flournoy, uh, there's uh, currently they you know they're moving around by the moment. There is but there is both a, a Chinese carrier battle group and a, a U.S. carrier battle group operating in close proximity around Taiwan as we speak. So you know knowing that, how can our commission constructively inform pressing defense policy issues? Obviously, you were previously undersecretary of defense for policy. You probably saw many think tanks put forward brilliant ideas and recommendations on what to do. But this time, I think is different in that the. I think we were discussing in our commission, we no longer have the luxury of endless time windows out into the future that we can uh, discuss and, and debate implementation on. I think the future is now. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on that? No, I think that we as a commission and commissioners can just really foot stomp the urgency of actually imp fully implementing many of these recommendations um, as, you know, uh, as Debbie said, you know we're it's it's late. We're running out of time. Um, I think you know when I was in last in government, we thought we were seeding our acquisition and defense program with capabilities that would come online in the in the in the 2030s, and that that was the appropriate timeline 
for you know China's emergence as a, a power we needed to worry about deterring more more seriously and and potentially m having to deal with that timeline's accelerated. Um, uh, I still I think I'm the first person to say that President Xi doesn't want to have to use force against Taiwan, but he's been very clear that if his efforts at political coercion, economic development, right. shrinking Taiwan's yeah. international space. Um, he, if those are not successful, he has asked his military to have options ready by 2027. We've seen in response to uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit and now Speaker McCarthy's meeting with President Tsai, essentially the early rehearsals of, of Chinese, a Chinese blockade of, of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So. The timeline has moved forward in terms of having the confidence in our ability to deter. Um, and I think that puts a different urgency, level of urgency on the table. Hmm. You know, what I like to say when people are feeling, you know, risk averse or I'm not sure we can make that change or you don't understand how hard this is or this is really difficult, I, I want to say, you know, if this were, if we knew that some crisis was going to come to a head in 2027 or 2029, some you know some period before the 2030s. At that, and we were not prepared. What would we look back on and wish we had done? And I think it's a list of the recommendations in our report mm. for starters, as well as other things. So, the only way that you're going to marry the force that we have, the legacy force and the emerging force B21 and new capabilities coming online with what we need for new operational concepts and effective deterrence mm -hmm. is to integrate, to speed and scale our integration of commercially sourced innovation. Marrying those capabilities with legacy mm. platforms that will still be with us to make them that much more effective, to enable new operational outcomes. So to me, that is, that is the task of the Department of Defense for the next five years, mm. and shame on us if we do not get there. Mm. I want to say there are a lot of p good people leaning forward and leaning into this in the department. I don't mean to suggest otherwise, but we need to be moving even faster mm. and more effectively. So along those lines, Secretary Esper, it's been mentioned before that you and Secretary James were adamant that we focus on clear and actionable recommendations mm -hmm. to confront the threats posed, especially and increasingly by China and Russia. Um, from your experience, uh, which of these recommendations appear more actionable in the near term, like a, something we can do, you know, the, the term of art is day one or day zero? And which uh, do you think, just from your own experience uh, across DC, will take longer to enact? And by longer, I mean like later this year going into next year, because I think uh, you know, the increasing sense is that's the time frames we're talking about now. Sure, sure. Let me first go back to the previous Please. question, because it, it's important. We, we get lost in timelines and, uh, and what it means, and it's, these things seem so far out. Xi Jinping has told the PLA that be prepared to seize Taiwan by 2027, and I know that feels like years away. But think about it this way. It's only two budget cycles away. Two budgets, right? So the current, the 24 budgets on the Hill right now, if we want to deal with that or be ready, you have to either submit something in 25 or 26 because the 27 budget won't come out till the end of 26 anyways. And so if I were to, if I were to tell you this is not a pen, but this is a, this is a weapon that can neutralize a Chinese aircraft carrier, if I apply it in today's system, it wouldn't go into the budget. It wouldn't be proposed to the to the Congress until one year from now. And then even then, it would take nearly another year to get approved by Congress. That's two years gone. That's the valley of mm -hmm. death. I'm not even talking about how time it takes to build them and then build these at scale. So are we out of time? You ask yourself, when you're dealing with timelines like that, we are way behind. Yeah. And we have to get serious about this. So what are the things, Stephen, that we could do quickly? I think anything that rests in the hands of the Pentagon's leadership of the Secretary of Defense or the DepSec Def are things to do now. Mm. Start doing it now. Start making the changes. Uh, you know, we've already had one success, if you will, with DIU being elevated. But it's, it's just not good enough to elevate it. Get involved with it, right? How do you resource uh, the new head of DIU? How do you give him the authorities, the budget he needs, et cetera, so, uh, so, far, uh, so forth and so on to do that? And then how do you start uh, doing all those other things that can really make a difference? Start working with maybe you can get Congress to approve 
a set number of, uh, of uh, capability-driven budgets. How maybe you can reduce some of those lines. I think the congressional ones will take longer because I think change on the Hill takes longer. You worked on the Hill. I worked on the Hill. I don't know where everybody else is, but change is hard, and you have a lot of good members who are real leaders trying to do the right thing, but there are a lot of folks trying to hold on to their turf, trying to hold on to control, mm -hmm. and I think it's just going to take a much longer pro uh, process there. But So I would say the things that DOD can control itself take charge of and start moving out now because time is not on our side. And uh, we're not the ones that drive that, that agenda per se. Mm. It's the other guys. Mm. So, Secretary James, along, along these lines, you, you've had uh, a deep career across, uh, unlike uh, Pete Modigliani, I, I won't say how many years. Uh, Thank you. Service, uh, deep career. S <laughs> s uh, smart, s I'm smart enough, uh, barely. Uh, so you've had a deep career across industry, trade associations, the Hill, uh, and then certainly in senior positions in the U.S. government. Along Secretary Esper's uh, commentary, how, uh, how important is it to, we talked earlier about having, having people on the same message, speaking with the same voice, and engaging the Hill as well. How important is it for these groups to work together, and, and, and any thoughts on how we can work together, uh, either within think tanks or without? Like, what's, what's a way, what's, what are some ideas for implementation of some of these great ideas we have? Well, you heard one of the authors talk earlier about champions. So to the extent we can identify the right champions on the outside as well as on the inside, that would be extremely helpful in my view. Now, obviously, we as commissioners and so on, we're going to be champions. Uh, there is a brand new uh, official in DOD, uh, Mr. Beck, I believe is his name. He was just appointed to be the head of DIU. I think he's in his third day on the job, so let's make sure he has this report in his hand on day four, mm. Mm. Um, meaning he will be a champion within DOD to hopefully try to advance the ball and get some of these things done. And to the extent we have those champions on the Hill, let's make sure that they are armed with the not only the report, but the uh, the talking points um, and the, the urgency points that we have made here today. So we've talked about first work on what you can control. I certainly agree with that. Anything that is within the department's purview right now uh, that can be um, changed with a, a, a memo from the Secretary of Defense mm. would hope that they would do so as rapidly as possible, always consulting with the Hill because let us remember that the Hill can um, agree with or disagree with anything that's done administratively as well. But let's try to get started on those. And to the extent we can get some champions uh, out in front for us, I think that will be um, an excellent way to proceed as well. Excellent. And I, I would add that we've already had uh, very strong uh, uh, responses from uh, numerous, again, bipartisan, which uh, is heartening. Uh, members uh, on the Hill as well as their staff. So it's, it's a, a good start, but still a lot to be done. Uh, one uh, final question before I turn to uh, a few remaining questions as we wrap up. And, and this is a topic that's come up a lot, and I think a, a vector on where the commission will be headed going forward is this new organization called Office of Strategic, Strategic Capital, OSC. Um, I'll start with uh, Undersecretary Lord, and I'll, I'll turn to you, Undersecretary Flournoy, as well. Uh, so you oversell something called the Trusted Capital Marketplace, right, TCM, which in some ways was uh, ahead of its time uh, in 2019 timeframe, right? Uh, how can we at the Commission ensure that OSC succeeds where TCM uh, struggled? And I think on a related note, uh, you're involved in a number of venture capital funds, private equity funds, and, and, and tech companies now. How can uh, private capital support uh, or existing organizations like AFWorks, right, that's scaled up dramatically, mm -hmm. as well as OSC in turn? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll turn to you first. It and then comes you. down to leadership and communication, I think. We have a situation where COVID made it clear that we had an issue with offshoring and lack of resiliency in our supply chains. And that began the discussion of broadening DPA Title III mm. and looking at the private sector for funding. Um, but there were other bigger issues for leadership in the building and on the Hill to focus on. Now that we've had the invasion of the Ukraine and everyone's um, painfully aware of our munitions inventory mm. challenges, 
and the fact we can't go it alone in many, many different areas, I think the time is right. And so communication from the very top, which mm -hmm. has been pretty good um, to begin with, I think is a key to that. Um, but then follow up and actually implementing and getting something done. So don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough in terms of rolling out a couple projects. Yeah. And I would just say from my observation of the field over the last you know, five, six years, very positive development is you've had the emergence of a number of venture capital funds uh, as well as private equity funds that have a mission orientation. Yes, they want to have a good return on investment for their, their LPs, but they are committed to national security. We have some of those people sitting in the room. Um, what they want to see from government is, first of all, clarity on what do you need. Mm. Give us clear signals on what do you need and give us a way to bring our best companies forward to you. Mm. Number two, um, Make be, we want to see visible, consistent efforts to reduce the barriers mm. um, for those for those companies. Um, whether it's ways of helping them across the valley of death, I hope the Office of Strategic Capital and leveraging various loan guarantee programs right. that SBA and others in the government offer. That's a thing. But they they need to see genuine partnership to reduce some of the barriers to entry and some of the barriers to surviving, you know, the valley of death. Um, and then they need to see successes. They need to th see some mm. things that actually make it into full-scale production and get to the warfighter. If you can point to a handful of those examples, the money is there, the mission focus is there, you will see people flocking. But we have too few success cases still mm. to point to and say, see, they're serious, this can work. Can I please? Two things in there, because I, uh, just for disclosure, pur disclosure purposes, I'm, I'm a partner in a venture fund and a board member of that same fund. And I will tell you, uh, I think our strategic capital ideas are important, but we all, this is another thing. We don't have a strategic capital problem in this country. It's $65 trillion plus dollars. The biggest thing we need, and Michelle touched on it, Ellen touched on it, is we need a clear signal. If, if you signal the VC community investors that you're going to buy something, that you're going that direction, the money will flow, mm -hmm. which is also why the recommendation to remove these barriers on of uh, 50% for VC makes no sense. The VCs do a really good job vetting yeah. business viability, technological viability, the capabilities of the leaders and founders. Uh, we should be following them in many ways. And so that's why I think, um, I, I think it's all out there. It's just it's a matter of us for, for going after it. And those are some other simple things that could be done that could really open the market up. But a clear signal, there's, there's no clearer signal than a contract <laughs> right, and this gets back to the right. the the, uh, the valley of death. But if there were other signals that could be given short of a contract, well, you'd see a lot of money flowing, and you'd see a lot a lot moving forward. And I know the firm I'm in, that's what we're looking for all the time. Or what are the signals of what the customer needs? We hmm. want to do the customer. Michelle's absolutely right. There is a mission focus out there, and this is a moment in time where we got to get those entrepreneurs, those VC firms, PE firms that are out there, to really get them on board, is to give them those signals to make these changes now before we lose them. Uh, Secretary James, any uh, additional comments on that? Yeah, I would say the other piece of advice I would give to, to VC firms is um, make sure that you understand the process because, you know, we're trying to streamline the process with these recommendations, but the process is always going to be somewhat daunting. And understand, for example, that when you're talking to a particular warfighter who may seem very, very interested in your technology, remember that individual where does that individual sit in the decision-making process? Remember, there's also acquisition people who need to be consulted. So understand the process and also listen. Listen to what their needs are. I Everything think that's important, It's a campaign, too. right? It's not one person that's going to get you there. Right. Hmm. So on a related note, there's a, an interesting question here. Uh, what do you believe is the right approach to choosing between GOTS versus COTS, right? Government off the shelf uh, versus commercial uh, off the shelf uh, technologies. And the, the explanation here is what would you say to those program managers, and this could be directed first towards you uh, under Secretary Lord, uh, uh, who are defaulting to GOTS solutions, especially for emergent technologies like cyber and AI, uh, which one could argue does not necessarily reflect a 20 friends, 21st century national security innovation base? Et cetera, et cetera. 
I think um, it is a great idea to use COTS when the COTS components or systems meet all of the warfighting requirements in terms of cybersecurity, hardening for a variety of different environments. There were a lot of missteps years ago with some very small electronic components put on nuclear weapons that met the specification that they were purchased to, which was not sufficient to really talk about it, mm. uh, talk about everything that had to be done. So there were failures of those mm. weapons. I think if you're a smart buyer, you need to go with the commercial solution every time, but it's incumbent upon the government buyer to make sure they mm. understand what needs to be done in terms of functionality and what sure. environments um, with those systems. I see you guys nodding anything to add. Uh, I was just, oh, I'm sorry. No good, no good. I was, I was going to say, I was going to just add in, piggybacking on what Ellen just said, I was going to add in maybe the element of time. Not every purchase of every capability is equally urgent as every other capability. So there could be something that's extremely urgent. Maybe it doesn't, it's something that's commercial, and, but it's extremely urgent. It doesn't cover every last element of the requirement, but maybe it's worth it. Enough, it's like Look at the streaming, um, you know, satellite imagery in Ukraine. Look at the attributable drones. That's where the risk is worth it. And so you have to just be a smart buyer because there's so much more we can do. Yeah, off the top of my head, I'd, I'd come up with three metrics and probably in this order, performance, availability, and cost. So is it the highest quality? So that's an e you can easily determine that. Is it available now or 10 years? Right? Mm. And, then, and then I'll worry about the cost. Right? I, mm. I, not that I'm not always worried about the cost, but if you have to rank one of those things, that's kind of how I would lay it, off, lay it out. But I think we have to be very careful about quality because sometimes we want to buy the superlative yeah. when, when the good enough, good enough will, do. will do. And that's where, tricky. that's the tricky part where yeah. judgment comes yeah, in. Yeah, my only, my only concern is, and you and I worked together on this when I was sec sec def and sec army I, I was trying to move us away from lowest cost technically acceptable oh. technically uh, yeah it's a spiral to the bottom yeah because it becomes a spiral to the bottom when you can have something that's a little bit better maybe cost a little bit more I think you have to go with what's best for the warfighter mm. so but yeah I yeah. generally agree the, it's uh, you know, it, it's an interesting discussion uh, and I think one of our recommendations tries to get at this right which is Generate, you know, it's easier to make a decision when you already have a good baseline that's accurate and current uh, of data to make that decision from. So, from your experience, and I'll, maybe I'll start with you, uh, did you often feel like your workforce had the latest and up to date uh, data on like what was the best or no. most appropriate? No. no. Okay. And this is where we have an issue. I think in terms of having electronic access to what's out there and being able to push information around. There are these little pockets of excellence we keep talking about, the Rapid Capabilities Offices, DIU, SCO, there are many of them, but they haven't scaled because it's a small, high-performance team that gets to go VFR direct to senior leadership to make decisions. Mm. Um, that's not scalable. So right. we have to have right. um, electronically available information. And there has to be a way for industry to access what the requirements and the needs are from the department and be able to go back and iterate on that um, without lots of meetings, with lots of people, with lots of discussion and plus ones and plus twos and so forth. Great. Any, anything else, Ted? No, I would just say there is a congressional component to this as well in terms of um, oftentimes, you know, the authorization committees has historically leaned farther forward in terms of giving the department lots of authorities, lots of support for prototyping, experimentation, et cetera. But when you get to the appropriators who feel very responsible for making sure every dollar is well, well spent, they'll often, you get into these chicken and egg conversations where, you know, the Navy will say, I'd like to buy a couple of, mm. you know, unmanned surface vehicles or unmanned uh, undersea vehicles. And the appropriators will say, well, what's your concept? And they'll say, well, I need a couple of them to experiment and develop a concept. Well, you don't have a concept, so why should we give you, mm -hmm. you know, more than one? And, you know, you get into these do loops of people being very risk averse, mm -hmm. understandably. But I think part of it is it's not only, you know, access to best data. We have to loosen the, the um, give a, have a little bit more flexibility, take a little bit more risk to allow the services to experiment and compete different concepts 
and develop that data. That gets back to delegation the, of requirements. Yes. So the, I know right. that one of the recommendations we've been talking about for a while is to change the JROC process. Right. So a lot yeah. of that gets delegated. So I think that it's, there's a congressional piece to getting comfortable with this that you know you have to allow for take some risk to allow mm -hmm. for experimentation concept development to be able to develop the performance data so that you can make a smarter a better yeah. informed production decision down the line but it, it everybody has to be a little bit more comfortable taking some risk given the timeline and the urgency that we mm -hmm. have to operate under and how important this innovation is to us strategically being able to deter china as a peer competitor well, and the four of you made a really good point earlier, which is uh, how much of this is dependent or codependent on interpersonal relationships. It, it, trust is something trust that's, of course, important. earned, not given. Uh, and having started my career right before 9/11, and then you know, walked through the uh, the the bad the bad old days of the uh, height of the Iraq War, and then seeing the reemergence and the pivot to Asia, and then now the situation we're in with China and Russia, oftentimes when things hit extremis, I've, from a layman's view, I've been surprised at how much uh, of government officials lean on the people that they quite understandably trust and believe and are, and are committed to. Uh, to that end, uh, I was going to make a joke about if you don't know what the J Rock process is, you. Well, it's only the J SIDS process. J SIDS and. Yeah, right. So yeah. it's how the joint staff comes up <laughs> if, with the requirements if, if, if and the J Rock is the body. Yeah, yeah. 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 anyhow. But I was going to say you probably shouldn't be here in this audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, the, uh, an audience is a closing question as we wrap up. And I think it's a relevant question. Uh, an audience member asked, uh, How would you explain to the average American how this report is relevant to them? Right, like we're talking about a lot of seemingly complex issues yeah. and driving equipment into th you know, theater, policy changes, the J Rock, J -SIDS, You know, how would you explain? And feel free to kind of go in turn how this me how this matters to someone outside of Washington D.C. Right, I'll, I'll I'll take the first step, which is we are we've entered in a new, much more competitive, contested period where our leadership is being contested. Um, our, um, you know, our position in the region of the world, the Indo-Pacific, which will have the most profound effects on the prosperity and security of Americans for the next 50 years, that position is being contested. The rules of the road that have created stability and prosperity are being contested. Um, we have to invest in the drivers of our own competitiveness here at home, economic, technological, and military. Um, if we are going to be able to prevent this competition from becoming conflict, mm. and if we're going to secure America's, you know, leadership and prosperity and, and security in the next half to, half century, so, mm. you know, this does impact. If we fail, Americans will feel it here at home in terms of the yeah. impact on the economy, the security, the world that they're living in, um, and our ability to influence, in, you know, events beyond our borders. Secretary Esper. Yeah, this is a fun one. I wish I had more time to think about it, but I'm trying to explain. How do you explain to an American people who know that they can go on their phone right now, they could order something from Amazon, and it will arrive tomorrow morning? And they'll know exactly where it will arrive and, and probably at what time. And then mm -hmm. tell them that, in, that that's the 21st century and that today's DOD is living in maybe the 19th. That's probably too bad. But the 20th century, where it takes 14 years to build an aircraft carrier, nine years from the Army to buy a handgun, right? And we can go on and on mm. and on mm. about stories of things taking too long and saying, do you really want your son or daughter fighting the next war with something that was designed in 1980, 1990? Or do you want them to have the best thing that's available now on the market? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can't promise that the recommendations uh, that we all put forward will, will deliver that now, but it will certainly move the ball a whole lot further. And I think most Americans would say, yeah, we need to do that because National security is okay. the most important thing, and our people, our young service members, mm -hmm. the, the, the young men and women who serve our country are the most valuable asset we have, so we should give them everything they need to do that they need to do their job and come home safely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what he just said, and plus, um, <laughs> God forbid we have to fight. We want to win. And even if, God forbid, we can't win, we sure don't want to lose. Amen. And these are the types of things that a group of leaders on a bipartisan basis who have been in the business a long time feel 
need to be done, and they're all doable, actionable, mm. um, we can get there. We just have to be willing to, uh, to change. So if we want to continue to enjoy the freedoms we do as Americans, we have to pay a little bit more attention to our national security. And here are 10 very clear, actionable steps we can take to help prevent a future where our children and grandchildren speak Mandarin as the first language. <laughs> All right. I, I think That's it's a note. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a relevant uh, discussion uh, and, and a relevant point. I, uh, you know, I'm in my mid 40s now, but I have three young children. You, know, you all have uh, children who are considerably older, uh, and it's not a. <laughs> you know how tall. he keeps reminding us about our age. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going, Steve. Steve. Keep, keep digging. Yeah. Keep digging. See what I, keep digging. <laughs> see what I did there. Uh, so I, I do think it, it, it's a clarifying point, if only because it's our children that are going to be fighting and, and living with these mistakes. And I think it's a relevant point to end on as a, a, as a, a focal point for the next uh, phase of the commission. So I'd like to wrap up now. Uh, for those of you who are here in person with us, uh, you're invited to the reception uh, afterwards. Uh, our staff outside will uh, guide you uh, uh, to the appropriate location. And for those of you online, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, we've really enjoyed it, as you can tell, uh, some of us more than others. And uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next Atlantic Council event. Uh, thank you very much.